It is such a joy to see you this morning. Uh, would you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 this morning? Um, we're getting our Advent series called The Unchanging King, and if the title sounds a bit familiar, I, I hope it sort of sounds familiar, it's because we actually used some of that phrasing in our teaching series from the book of Daniel. Um, we believe that as Daniel was pointing us toward the first and second coming of the Lord, if you remember that, I mean, it really pointed us to Christ's first and second coming. Um, we thought that that theme of the unchanging king would be appropriate to focus on during the Christmas season, um, to see how he had promised the coming of the unchanging king. And that's what we'll look at today, how he fulfilled his promise uh, in bringing the unchanging king to us. And we'll talk about that next week. And then we're going to talk about the promise of the unchanging king to come again. And we'll talk about that on, on December 26th. Uh, so please follow along with me as I read what I know. I know you guys are super excited about reading these next 17 verses with me. These are probably, I bet you're thinking, oh, I'm so glad Pastor Billy is going to read the genealogy. I'm so glad. I've been so looking for the, forward to this since January. I've just, been, oh, well, I hope by the end of the sermon that you'll actually feel that way. So. Let us turn to the inerrant, sufficient, authoritative, divinely inspired word of God, starting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheliatel, and Sheliatel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon, to the Christ, 14 generations. Well, Heavenly Father, every word of Scripture we believe is divinely inspired, including genealogies. And so we look to hear and understand and know better the gospel of Jesus Christ through the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Would you touch our hearts today with fresh hope and fresh faith and fresh peace and fresh rest in what we learn about our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to admit... I just, I'm always kind of boggled about the songs of Christmas. I love what we sing here. 
but I'm boggled about the songs we hear out there. And one of the strangest songs to me at Christmas time is the one that says, All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. I'm, I'm, so I'm all sorry to have to say that to you because now there's a melody that's going to springing up and a lot of it. So I'm sorry to do that. There's, I'm going to hopefully replace that melody with another one in just a minute. A far more redemptive melody, <laughs> if you'll just bear with me. You know, it, only, it not only has nothing to do about Jesus, it really makes me want to meet the child who only put down two things on their Christmas list. Front tooth number one and front tooth number two. I, I really want to meet that child. I've never seen a child in my 62 years of living uh, mention <laughs> a tooth, let alone tooths. Um, I mean, come on, kid. You know, you almost want to say, make the most out of this list. Your teeth are going to grow back. You don't even need to ask for that. Come on, you need to strike while the iron is hot. You need to ask for Legos or Playstations or phones or maybe even a pony, <laughs> which is, of course, what I always tell my kids. I want to get my grand girls a pony. That's about how they, they respond to me like that, too. They just, they just are not very excited about that. But, you know, it made me wonder. There's always a story behind things, you know. So it made me wonder, what in the world, what kind of story inspired these lyrics? Well, it was written in 1944 by Donald Gardner while he was teaching music at a public school in New York. He taught second grade students. And he noticed that most of his second grade students were missing their two front teeth. <laughs> so that inspired him to write the song. And I'm thinking that it wasn't so much the children who were really wishing that they get two front teeth for Christmas, as much as it was Mr. Gardner, the music teacher, who was wishing they had their front teeth so that they, they would be singing more songs than whistling. Wish, whistling songs, right? So that they would be, they could actually say Merry Christmas and not Merry Christmas. Christmas. So do you see? Where that's, that was the whole background behind that. But then I thought a little bit more about it. If we had something missing that was staring us in the face every day, while we looked in the mirror of our lives, we'd probably be asking for that empty spot to be filled, too. I think you know now that I'm not talking about teeth anymore. I'm talking about your hearts. As you think about the last 13 days before Christmas, 13 sleeps, maybe, before Christmas, What's missing in your heart right now? What, what's the source of any emptiness that you're just longing to be filled? You would just love it if this sense of emptiness and sorrow and missing and longing could be filled. You know, as much as I dislike the secularized version of the Christmas season, you know the Christmas season does a great job at exposing what we think is missing and where we feel empty and what we think will solve it. It is a great diagnostic. Because if you, if you remove Jesus from the picture, right, and, and all you see are these ideals of, of what the holiday season should produce in a family or in the heart. And, but that's just so attached, isn't it, to, to so many heartaches and disappointments because it never lives up to its expectations. So the Christmas season really is a helpful thing to help us see where, where we feel empty and what we feel is missing. And sadly, though, this season tends to expose all this that is empty and missing, but maybe even worse, how we try to fill it with everything except Jesus. Some of us, the emptiness is rooted maybe in the context of a relationship, someone we miss, or maybe it's someone we haven't even met yet, but we sure hope to meet someday. For others, it has a sense to do with your purpose or your identity 
or maybe the accomplishments that you think would, would give your, your life some meaning. It, it feels like statements like this, by now I, I thought I would have graduated by now, man, that's missing. By now I thought I would have been married or would have had a child. By now I thought I would have gotten the job that I spent so many years in school studying for or the promotion that I've been working overtime to get. By now, I thought I would have owned my own home, or by now, I, I thought I would have been healed. I've been, so, I've been sick for so long, these missing and empty things. By now, I thought I would have outgrown this bad habit of mine, or, or what's worse than a bad habit, a sin problem that I just don't seem to be able to overcome. By now, I thought I wouldn't have been so bitter. Because what's really missing for me is that part of my heart that I felt like somebody just reached into my life, into my soul, and took my heart out of me. Where, where is that missing thing in you? Where do you feel empty? Of course, we know that even if we could find all these missing things, or if we could have all these empty places filled, you know what? We would still find ourselves with a longing that none of those answers to those emptinesses could fill. Because this longing is not for something created, is it? It's a longing for the creator himself. It's a longing for him to come and fill us with his love and to make everything that is wrong right again. Isn't that what you really feel? The longing is not new. You heard it and felt it when we sang, O come, O come, Emmanuel. I hope you got a sense of this. We covered about 2,000 years of biblical history this morning when we read the genealogy of Jesus. And I hope you heard the refrain of, O come, O come, Emmanuel, even as we're reading through the genealogy, come and ransom captive Israel who mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. I think that the contemporary song that comes closest to the feeling and truth communicated in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is Andrew Peterson's song, Is He Worthy? It's become a favorite of mine, and I think for many of you, every time we feel the pain of loss or emptiness or loneliness or division or separation or illness, isn't it so easy to identify with the refrain, refrain do you feel the world is broken? And what's the answer? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. We could very easily sing that song with every generation mentioned in Christ's genealogy. When it mentions that Abraham's son was Isaac, we remember how many years they waited for Isaac to be born and how many sins they committed along the way. And don't we want to sing, don't we want to sing with them? Do you feel the world is broken? Oh, we do. When we come to King David and consider the adultery and the murder he committed along with the path Toward, toward being the father, along the pathway of being the father of Solomon. Don't we want to sing, do you feel the shadows deepen? Oh, we do. And yet with all the sinners that are listed in this genealogy, and in spite of all the sins they committed, don't we see in generation after generation God's faithfulness to keep his promise to send King Jesus to save us from our sins in spite of this, this 2,000 year pathway of sinfulness and disobedience and covenant breaking. And that's where the lyrics of the song change for us, isn't it? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Come on. We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is, the, is a new creation coming? Come on, y'all. It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light in our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, forget it is. Yes. Yes, it is. And that's why we need a genealogy for Christmas. 
So that's where I got the title from. I'm sorry, you know, I'm just such a goober. All I want for Christmas is a genealogy? Yes, because it reminds us of this. So that's where we're going to go with this this morning. The main point this morning, it's in your notes, we need the genealogy of Christ the King for Christmas because it reminds us of God's covenant faithfulness to send us the Savior of sinners and sustains our faith in him until he comes again. So let's look at how this unfolds. First of all, Christ's genealogy came through covenants and kings. And we see this in the very first verse in Matthew chapter 1.1. 1, 1. It's really what the book of Matthew is all about. Jesus is the Christ. In other words, he is the long-awaited Messiah. He's the anointed Savior King who would deliver his people from their bondage to sin. And to prove that Jesus is the Christ, Matthew is going to go on to show how the Christ had to be the long-promised son of Abraham. So you see that in this very first verse, too. So Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is just laying a table for what the rest of the book of Matthew is all about. God made a covenant promise to Abraham that said that it would be through faith in a son who would come through the family tree of Abraham that people from every ethnicity on earth would be blessed with the gift of salvation. So, oh boy, come, oh come, Emmanuel, if you're going to bring salvation, if that's what it means for the son of Abraham to come, oh, we can't wait for you to get here. And so that's why we're going to see that Christ's genealogy goes back to Abraham. Even more, Matthew was written to show how Christ was also the long-promised son of David, meaning he would come out of the family tree of David. Only Christ could be the king of kings who would rule over all creation. And only Christ would be the one whose kingdom would never end. There really is only one person in all of all of human history that could fit, fulfill the, the demands of this genealogy, and it is Jesus Christ. And I hope to show you a little bit of that this morning. So let's start at Abraham. Christ's ancestry is traced up to the royal line of King David. And then from King David, you see those who descend from him up into the birth of Jesus. So we could say that Christ's genealogy is a summary of the primary gospel storyline of the Bible. Uh, this genealogy is presenting us with Jesus' family tree up until his birth, death, and resurrection. And then inviting people to become a part of his family tree through faith in him, um, faith in who he is and what he did on the cross. So I, I don't want you to get past this family tree without also asking, is your name in this family tree? This is the line up to Jesus. Jesus comes. He's born of a virgin. He lives a sinless life. He dies a substitutionary death. He rises again to prove the sacrifice was accepted. And now all who put their faith in him become a part of that family tree. So this genealogy has implications that affect us today if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Matthew takes what the world would have, would have considered to be an insignificant family line, and he organizes really all of human history around it. We've, we've talked about that. All of history, all of redemptive history finds its answer in Jesus Christ, both in his first coming and his second coming. All of history is not built on Republicans or Democrats or Russia or Iran or China or the United States. These are pawns in the story. All of history is about God coming to save sinners from the judgment their sins deserve and getting all the glory for it and giving us all the joy. That's what history is about. Are you, is your story part of that story by putting your faith in Jesus, the one who all of this genealogy was pointing toward and the one who now saves people to bring them in to his family tree? Listen, genealogies were of critical importance to the Jewish people because 
because of who they descended from had a direct impact upon their lives. It's not like today where people just like to kind of know their genealogy out of curiosity. It's a great thing. It's not a bad thing at all. I think some people are doing it to try to find some purpose or some identity uh, rather than it being a necessity. But y'all, this was a necessity in the life of Israel. And let me explain a little bit why. Um, it's it, to distinguish between genealogies and our, our, our propensity to go to ancestry.com and just curiosities and stuff like that. I want you to see how during the time of Matthew, what genealogies were thought of, not like today. So to try to kind of just put to the side your pursuit of your family genealogy. And let's see what, what does this genealogy mean in a biblical context. I, I think the best way to do that is to see a genealogy in the eyes of Matthew and the, and the, the New Testament believers as a resume. I think it's, it's better to see it as a resume than just a family uh, legacy because you needed this resume to prove you have the credentials to fulfill the job. For example, according to Numbers chapter 26 and, and, and chapters 35, you had to know your family tree. You had to know your tribe in order to know your inheritance and to know where you were supposed to live when you finally came into the promised land. You had to know your family tree. That, that's day-to-day -day important, isn't it? That's just not curiosity. This has everything to do with my current condition and my future condition. In order to serve as a priest, you had to prove that you were in the genealogy of Levi, which became a huge issue when Israel was returning from the exile out of Babylon because only the ones who truly had a right to be called priests could be priests because you know the story. If you got into the, the priesthood, if you, were, if you were falsifying your genealogical resume, and just thought it would be cool to be in the priesthood. I'm, a, I'm, I'm of the tribe of Levi. What happened to priests who weren't truly priests? Oh, <laughs> honey, I didn't expect sound effects. But that's right. I mean, it, it could be deadly, couldn't it? It could be deadly because you're misrepresenting Jesus. There was a reason that it had to come the way it came. So you can just imagine if a king... So we're just talking about land ownership and inheritance and, and priesthood. But can you imagine if a king is to receive the honor due him as a legitimate king, if he's to have any credibility at all, then it has to start with the proof that he comes from a royal line, especially if you're in the line of David, especially in your, in your line of David. So yeah, let's get, this gets really, really difficult here. And I want you to see the miracle of how God worked and brought to pass all of his promises in spite of the sinfulness of, of his people. You can see why this is important when we, when we remember that God made a covenant promise to David in 2 Samuel 7. So I put this in your notes. So follow this with me. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Who shall come, this, this is so, so important, from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Wow, this is it. This is where the promise of the king of kings comes from. This is fantastic. Oh, this is fantastic. Okay, well, Jesus must be able to prove that he has a right to the throne because he is the prophesied son of David. And that's where his genealogy comes in, and, and this is why we need a genealogy for Christmas. And it's here where we run into a real problem, though, and why only one man in all of history has the qualifications to be the eternal son of David, because little did David know that down through his family tree there was going to be some real scoundrels and of those scoundrels, one was found in verse 11. And you, it's in your notes too, if you'll follow that with me. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. What are we getting at there? Well, 
let's go back and see what the Bible had to say about good, I put good in quotes, King Jeconiah. And we see this in Jeremiah 22. And in Jeremiah 22, Jeconiah is referred to as Coniah. So let's see what happened in this, in this genealogy. Starting in verse 24. As I live, declares the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hand of those who seek your life into the hand of those whom you are afraid, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I hope some of these kind of remind you a little bit of the study of Daniel. And into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and the mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they will long to return, there they shall not return. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken pot, a vessel no one cares for? Why are he and his children hurled and cast into a land that they do not know? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man, Coniah, down as childless. A man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. Wow, you see the problem. So wait a minute. So there's a curse put on King Jeconiah that none of his biological offspring can ever sit on the throne of David. And yet Jeconiah is listed in the line of David. And the other prophecy that God gave to David was that someone from his own body would come to prove that he was in the royal line of David. <laughs> There's no way this can be solved humanly, can it? There's no way. How is it solved? Well, if Jesus had been the biological son of Joseph, he could have never sat on the throne of David. He would have been under the curse. And yet the promised son of David had to be able to prove that he had a legal right to the throne. So God had to devise a plan by which Jesus would be the, the legitimate legal heir to the throne through Jeconiah and yet not be biologically related to Jeconiah or any of Jeconiah's descendants. And that's why Matthew's genealogy ends the way it does. Did you notice how it, it this was the father and so-and-so, and this was the father of so-and-so, and the end of the, the genealogy in verse 16 says, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, and that's where this father stuff ends, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. But it doesn't, but doesn't the eternal king of kings have to be out of the bloodline of David? Yes. Here's the back, here's the back story about that. David had two sons from Bathsheba. In this, in this genealogy, Solomon is the one named. And he was one of, one of uh, the sons from Bathsheba. But there was another one named Nathan. And guess who was descended through Nathan's? family tree Mary and that's what the genealogy in Luke teaches us so they're different those two genealogies are different Matthew shows us that Jesus came from David's legal family tree through being adopted by Joseph so he has a legal right to the throne in that way and he comes through David's bloodline through Mary's family tree so he, he alone is the only one who could sit on the throne of David for all eternity. Oh, wait, there's just one other problem. So how does Mary get pregnant? Miracle of miracles, the virgin birth. And so you begin to see, oh my goodness. Start. Do you feel the world is broken? Oh, we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Man, we do. 
Do you really believe that all the dark won't keep the light from shining through? We do. And why is that? Because we needed a genealogy for Christmas. That's why. So all the rulers of this world are not in ultimate control, is it? All the sins of the world cannot stop God's plan to seek and save the lost. Guys, God is constantly at work in the history of the world, regardless of what you see on Fox or CNN or any other place. He's constantly at work, and he's done all of this so that you might become part of his family, that you might be part of his family tree through faith, in Christ. Second point is Christ's genealogy includes princes and prostitutes and pagans to show us that salvation is by grace alone. Jesus Christ is the one and only true Savior King, but he wasn't a king like any other king. And aren't we glad that he's a king of grace, right? And if you're going to be included in his family tree, that's the only way you're going to get in. It's not going to be by your works. It's not going to, your sins aren't going to be the ultimate disqualification. There's one who came and paid the price for it all and offers you that salvation as a gift of grace. Many people today are a bit hesitant to explore their genealogy. Have you ever done, have you ever, I just wonder where, where y'all are on that. For fear of, of I mean, so there's this one thing of, well, man, if I go back, maybe my family came through the, from the Mayflower, and maybe, you know, maybe I was related to Abraham Lincoln, or who knows what, I don't know, you know, but there's the other part of it. Maybe my great, 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 great uncle Abdul was an axe murderer. Just in case you know, I'm not being disrespectful. My dad's side of the family is Arabic, and uh, my grandparents came from Damascus. And when I first started understanding genealogies, and then I heard that the last name Reyes means king, I went to my dad. I said, Dad, we got to go dig into our genealogy because king, you know, this is going to be cool. And dad said, son, calm down, calm down. I think... Knowing, knowing some things about our family, I think we'd only find out that we were the king of camel thieves. <laughs> That's what my dad said. So we may not want to go there, son. You may not be as excited about what you might dig up here. Um, I don't know. Have you ever felt ashamed of being related to some of the people in your family? Have you ever wished you could edit some of the members of your family tree? <laughs> Especially when you need to introduce someone special. To, you're bringing home someone to meet your family for the first time. And that happened for me. Uh, some of you guys know my mom was a, an alcoholic. My dad was an abuser. And as I'm bringing Jan home to meet my family, oh, how I'm praying. Please. Can mom not get drunk tonight? Please, can my dad's anger not be put on display? I'm really kind of wanting to not associate myself with that family tree, self-righteous man that I was. Especially after my dad, Jan gave dad a Christmas present, and I'll never forget this. He, he's sitting in his recliner, Jan comes and says, Merry Christmas, and she gives him the present, and my dad looks her in the face with this dead look, takes her gift and tosses it aside and just looks at it. Yeah, I've wanted to edit my family tree before. Well, if a genealogy is something like a resume, it'd be very tempting to try to change some of the things about our family trees and to make you more acceptable, I guess, to make us more acceptable. I saw that all the time when I worked for Shell Oil. I was in human resource management, and I did a lot of interviewing, and I looked at a lot of resumes. And I would see, I would, I would, you, you'd learn to ask questions. And so if somebody looked like they had, they had been working for maybe 15 years for one company, I would ask, so did you work for 15 years for company XYZ? And I, a lot of times people would start fidgeting. No. Oh, okay. can you tell me the jobs that you had before that? Well, which one? 
Oh, oh, I see. So you're editing your resume because you're ashamed, right? You, you, just, you, you just need something of your own works to somehow represent you and make you acceptable. Well, have you ever considered the kinds of people that God, by his grace, included in Christ's family tree? If you're going to try to self-manufacture a genealogy that demonstrated your worth through your family tree, you might consider uh, including maybe a few of the people in this family tree, but not many, probably. And why is that? Well, because even Christ's genealogy tells the gospel. It's very clear in reading these names that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's very clear in these names there are none good, no, not one. It's very clear in this list that the only reason they've been included by God is because of salvation by grace alone and not by the works of any man. You can see it in the first two men that are, no, that are mentioned, in Abraham and in David, and in spite of their good works and deeds, did both men still need the grace of God to get into this family tree? I hope your answer is yes, because, because they are examples of why Christ came in spite of their goodness. Listen, it doesn't rule out that there weren't redeeming elements and times in their lives. Abraham gave us such a display of the picture of a father who was willing to, to sacrifice his only son. We get a real picture of that. Oh, but Abraham did some other things too. He lied about his wife to save his own skin and didn't even care of what this might do to her when he tried to pass her off as his sister. And he got tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm so tired of waiting on the Lord. Maybe if I take things into my own hands. And so you know what he did. So, so okay, let's, let's, let's just call it what it is. Let's, let's have adultery. Maybe adultery will bring the promised ch child to pass. And then, after Ishmael is born, do you know what he prayed? God, could you just bless this? Could you just bless the works of my hands? Abraham needed a salvation by grace, didn't he? Guess who else does? <laughs> you and me. That's why all this is there, guys. That's why all this is there. How about David? Oh, my goodness. You know some of his amazing stories. He portrays the gospel in his defeat of Goliath. I, it kills me how many times that the gospel is not mentioned in the story of David and Goliath because it's just a gospel story. It's a picture of God's Redeemer, the King, who has come to save his people from certain death. That's what the story's about. That, it's about a foreshadowing of Jesus. It's not, hey, take your five stones so you can kill your Goliath. You know, the Goliath of, 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 of finances and the Goliath of... Whoa. It's not about that. So praise God for how David illustrated the gospel. But did you notice the way that genealogy represented him? The father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Uriah is one of his best friends. I think that gets lost in the story. He was one of David's mighty men. And David commits adultery with his wife Bathsheba. I mean, do you, have, you ever been, have you ever been betrayed like that? When I was a junior in high school, my best friend Robert went to Alaska. <laughs> To, uh, for a summer job, and he, he had a girlfriend named Diana. He said, dude, can you keep an eye out for Diana while I'm gone? Sure. So I'm hanging out with Diana. Next thing I know, she's smooching me. She's smooching me. Babe, the only explanation, I guess I'm irresistible. That's, I just said that because I just wanted to see her face. My wife finds me very resistible. And I give her plenty of reason <clears throat> to be resistible. But there's probably nothing that strikes a blow to where there is this unfaithfulness within such intimate relationships. 
And that's what David did. But he didn't, he, he didn't just commit adultery. He tried to cover it up. Tried to cover it up by bringing Uriah home. Go enjoy some family time. Listen, go, go spend some time with your wife. You know, you deserve it. You've been fighting the battle. Go and enjoy time at home. Hoping that that would mean that they would be together, that they would be intimate, and then no one would know. There was no DNA test, right? No one would know that this wasn't Uriah's child. But Uriah had more integrity than David, didn't he? No, sir. No, sir. My fellow soldiers are out on the battlefront risking their lives for the king. And I, I won't enjoy the pleasures of family as long as they're, on, they're fighting the battle. <laughs> wow. So what does David do? You know the story. He puts a contract out on his life. David, the man after God's own heart, murders one of his best friends. And he's in the genealogy. They were normally just populated with the names of men, not, not, uh, but not Christ's family tree. Christ came to save male and female, didn't he? Jew and Gentile. Rahab, known as the harlot. I hope that when we see her in heaven, <laughs> I hope that that's it's just Rahab. Awesome. You know, it's not Rahab the harlot. She, she certainly was a prostitute. And she was a pagan. And isn't that another part of the story? That, the, that salvation is to go to every ethnic group on earth. So you see how this genealogy is telling the gospel. It's, and, and the only way to get in on it is by grace, regardless of the life you've lived. But the story just gets darker. There's Judah, who seemed to have some propensity to do business with prostitutes, including having this incestuous, he didn't know it at the time, he thought this woman was a prostitute. And he goes and he, he does business with her. Little does he know it's his daughter-in-law. I mean, you guys, do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. And both Judah and Tamar are included King Manasseh turns Israel toward the false god, god Baal. He sets up idols in the temple. He uses mediums, and he enlists people who talk to the dead. He participated in witchcraft, and here's the, the worst of it all. He takes his son and puts him on the, the burning white-hot statue of Molech. If you've ever seen that, Molech's arms are set out like this, and the statue is burned to be white-hot. And children are offered as a sacrifice to this false god. And Manasseh is in this genealogy by grace alone. Do you see, do you see why we needed Christ's genealogy for Christmas? Do you see why all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. See, no one was good enough to be included by their works because even their best works were filthy rags. No one was bad enough to be excluded because of their sin because Jesus paid it all. The last part is this. Christ's genealogy tells us that he gives and preserves our rest and peace. So hopefully you notice at the end there that he highlighted three sets of 14. Talked about different periods in that 2,000 year history. So did you notice that? That's the last in the last verse. And if you've been reading your, um, your uh, Advent devotional, so good. Sinclair Ferguson, oh, I would love to grow up to be like him someday. <laughs> He's such a pastor. And he describes his answer to the 14, the three sets of 14, is, is pretty interesting and I think has value. He talks about how there was a numeric equivalent to Hebrew letters. 
And so if you were to take David's name, the Hebrew letters of David's name, and put their, their Hebrew numeric equivalent, it would add up to 14. So what he's saying is that the text is essentially saying Dave, three times, David, 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 to remind us that there's a king, David, to come who will reign forever. And I think that's, that could be very likely. I think there's another answer as well. Probably maybe another application maybe is a good way to say it. Seven's a really significant number in the Bible. It speaks of completion, perfect completion. It points to rest. God rested on the seventh day. Every seven years, the land of Israel was supposed to rest, to, to lie fallow. Levitic, Leviticus talks, 25 talks about the seventh of seven years called the year of, some, you guys know it, Jubilee, right? And what happens in the year of Jubilee? All debts were forgiven in Israel and all slaves were freed. Well, in Matthew, the three segments of 14, I am terrible at math, but I could even do this one, are six segments of seven. And in keeping with what the Jews knew about the year of Jubilee, I think it's showing that the promised Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David, is the Son of God, who himself is the true and final year of Jubilee. And through him, all debts are forgiven. There's no more slavery to sin. And he is our perfect peace and rest. And that's why Jesus says, so come to me. And hasn't he proven his credentials to us this morning? So what does he say? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And it won't be just any rest. It'll be rest for your souls. Eric, you will bring the team up. It'll be rest and peace for those places that are empty and missing and hurting, and you feel more need than supply. And Jesus will be that rest if you'll turn and you'll put your faith in him this morning afresh. So for some of you, that might mean putting your faith in Jesus for the very first time to be your Lord and Savior. He's really, we've really seen that he alone has the credentials to save you from your sins and to give you a new beginning with him. And to give you a peace and rest that is, that is not dependent on your circumstances or on your income or on your health or on your marital status. or It is not on anything. It's dependent upon who he is and what he's done for us at the cross. So could you stand?